You know, I guarantee you that that ain't going to cut it when it comes to the pro these kinds of problems, when it comes to the spread of AIDS in America today or in the rest of the world or to these other problems that I've already mentioned. Prayer isn't going to cut it. And somebody's going to say, that's heresy. Well, I'll guarantee you that there is a time not to pray. Again, they're going to say, heresy. You know, don't you know? What do you mean not a time? There's, there's a time not to pray. Don't you know that in 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse 17, it tells us to pray without ceasing? Don't you know that Philippians 4, 6, and 7 says, be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, let your request be, no, be made to God with thanksgiving. And the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, shall guard your hearts and your minds in the Christ Yahshua. Well, of course I know that the Bible says those things. Matter of fact, if you go across this nation, you find out, you probably find a lot of people that I've quoted Philippians 4, 6, and 7 too, that were struggling with certain problems in their lives. And I've quoted that too. It's a favorite scripture of mine. Of course I know that it says that. All of that true is true. But I'm here to tell you that there is still a time not to pray. Turn with me to Joshua, the seventh chapter. You know, if I seem a little bit overly excited this morning, I think you'll find out why as we go on into this message. You've probably already got it figured out. You know, every time I look at that cartoon, I can remember the first time that somebody handed it to me. And every time that I've looked at it since, every time that it's come up in a file, every time I've used it in a message, it makes me sick to my stomach. Because this cartoon depicts Christianity very well. That's not a slam on Christianity. That's not a non-truth on modern Christianity, that is, again. That is true. That is truth about where modern Christianity is today. And it makes me sick. There is a time not to pray. Joshua 7. Now, Joshua 7 is beginning right at that period of time. Right after the great miraculous conquest that Joshua and the Israelites made over the city of Jericho. The great victory. Joshua 7 then begins. Or excuse me. That has taken place, but also before, jo before, jo before chapter 7 has taken place, they've, they've also gone... Now after destroying Joshua... Or, or, uh, Jericho, they've now gone on... Oh, excuse me. No, I was right the first time. Jericho has been destroyed. It picks up from that point on. Chapter 7, and I want to begin with verse 1. I want to read a good part of this. Verse 1, it says, But the sons of Israel acted unfaithfully in regard to the things under the ban. For Achan, the son of Carmi, the son of Zabdi, the son of Zerah from the tribe of Judah took some of the things under the ban. Therefore, the anger of Yahweh burned against the sons of Israel. As, as Israel was sent to conquer Jericho, there were certain things God says you're not to touch, you're not to possess, you're not to take. You're to burn them, you're to destroy them. You're not to have anything to do with them. But there was one man who, made, who disobeyed God's command in that regards and took something under the ban. Verse 2 then picks it up and it says, Now Joshua sent men from Jericho to Ai. They had destroyed Jericho and they said, Now let's go and let's continue with our conqueror of the promised land. Ai was next in line. Now Joshua sent men from Jericho to Ai, which is near beth Avon, east of Bethel, and said to them, Go up and spy out the land. So the men went up and spied out Ai. And they returned to Joshua and said to him, Do not let all the people go up. Only about two or three thousand men need go up to Ai. Do not make all the people toil there, for they are few. They, they had just seen, they just experienced what happened to Jericho, and they said, Hey, if Jericho went, came down that easily... We certainly don't need all the men for this one. It's a lot smaller. Verse 4, So about 3,000 men from the people went up there, but they fled from the men of Ai. And the men of Ai struck down about 36 of their men and pursued them from the gate as far as Shebarim and struck them down on the dis descent. So the hearts of the people melted and became as water. Verse 6, listen carefully. That has just happened. And then it says, Then Joshua tore his clothes... 
and fell to the earth on his face before the ark of Yahweh until the evening, both he and the elders of Israel, and they put dust on their heads. What were they doing? They were in repentance, and they were praying unto their God. And Joshua said in his prayer, he says, Alas, Lord Yahweh, why didst thou ever bring this people over to Jordan, only to deliver us into the hand of the Amorites to destroy us? If only we had been willing to dwell beyond the Jordan. O Lord, what can I say since Israel has turned their back before their enemies? For the Canaanites and all the inhabitants of the land will hear of it, and they will surround us and cut us off, cut off our name from the earth. And what will thou do for thy great name? And I'm sure there was much more to his prayer than just that because he did it. He prayed all day long. And what was God's response to this fervent prayer of this righteous man? Verse 10. And it says, So Yahweh said to Joshua, Rise up. Why is it that you have fallen on your face? What was he saying? He was saying, Joshua, now's not the time to pray. And then he tells him what to do. Verse 11, Israel, God is speaking, and he says, Israel has sinned, and they have also transgressed my covenant, which I commanded them. And they have even taken some of the things under the ban and have both stolen and deceived. Moreover, they, they have also put them among their own, own things. Therefore, the sons of Israel cannot stand before their enemies. They turn their backs before their enemies, for they have been a, become accursed. I will not be with you anymore unless you destroy the things under the ban from your midst. Rise up, consecrate the people and say, Consecrate yourselves for tomorrow, for thus Yahweh the God of Israel has said, There are things under the ban in your midst, O Israel. You cannot stand before your enemies until you have removed the things from under the ban, from, from, uh, excuse me, under the ban uh, from your midst. He said, Joshua, get up. Now's not the time to pray. Now's the time to judge the situation, to bring judgment down upon the one who had been disobedient to God's command. And, of course, that's what's been, then transpired, as you know the story. But the next day, God showed which man it was who had taken the things under the ban, and he was judged, and punishment dealt out to him. People very clearly, according to that passage, there's a time, at least in God's mind, in His sight, that we're not to pray. That prayer is not the answer. You know, not only that, not only is there a time when we need to get up off our knees and act, there are, not only is there a time that we're not to pray, but in the same light, there's also a time when preaching isn't enough either. Let me. I, one thing I haven't done with this cartoon in the past is read any of the the uh, article that that uh, follows it or that's underneath the cartoon. The title of the article underneath that cartoon is "Preaching Abstinence Isn't Enough." Let me read you the first paragraph. Now, let me tell you, I'm 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 in, I'm in agreement with what the next paragraph says now we don't we aren't coming from the same stand i'll guarantee you but i'm in agreement with this author's mark woods from denver i'm in agreement with what he says at least in this first paragraph he says naive would be a polite word to use in reference to people who think admonishing sexual abstinence outside of heterosexual marriage is going to do anything to stop the spread of sexually transmitted diseases i amen that naive is a polite way to say it for anyone who thinks that preaching is going to stop what's going on as far as the sexually transmitted diseases aids and gonorrhea and syphilis and all the other ones that have come before it's not going to work he goes on to say churches have been bleeding that message since i was a child interesting that he used bleeding what bleeds sheep, sheep. Who, who are israel god's sheep They're, they've been bleeding it they've bleated a lot of other things in the past too that certainly weren't, weren't right he says, churches have been bleeding that message <clears throat> since I was a child. <clears throat> it didn't work then, and it still doesn't. And he's right. <clears throat> there's a time not only when prayer is not the answer, but there's a time when preaching isn't enough as well. I don't know if you noticed, but you know there's really not much difference 
between the boob tubes answer and modern Christianity's answer. In essence, they're very similar. There's not much difference between the answer of the boob tube that ed- of education, that educating is the answer, or that preaching, abstinence is the answer, or just praying either. There's mu- not much difference. Why do I say that, that there's not much difference? Because they both end up in the same with the same result. They both lead to further inactivity. To what could be called do-nothingness. The answer of just go out and get educated. What in the world is that going to do in stopping the spread of AIDS? And what is preaching today? Preaching abstinence against it. Now it's going to, now don't get me wrong, that is definitely going to affect a small minority, but it's only a small minority that that's going to be effective on. What's preaching going to do for the rest of the world? The rest of the world's problem in this area and in all the other areas. And what's it create? Inactivity. Both of them. And do nothingness. You know, we've been warned in 2 Timothy 3 and verse 7. Talks about people there who are always learning and never able to come to the knowledge of truth. Always learning. You know, not only do we have that problem in society as a whole today, but we've got that problem in American churches today to do, today as well, just like they did in the first century. Paul, when he wrote that to Timothy, wasn't talking about people out there in the world who were always learning and never, never coming to Christ. He was talking about people in the church who were always learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. And we've got America full of churches and pulpits who fit that description. Turn with me to James 2 in the very same light. James chapter 2. And I believe that's the, I believe that we in James chapter 2 we find what it means when it when Paul talked about people or described people who were always learning but never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Well, if they're always learning, they're always coming up with knowledge. What does it mean? What is what could that mean? Never coming to the knowledge of the truth. I think James 2 has something to say in that regards. I want to just, I'm going to skip through most of the verses. Uh, I just want to read four different verses, 17, 20, 24, and 26. Listen carefully. 17, it says, Even so faith, if it has no works, is dead, being by itself. Verse 20, But are you willing to recognize, you foolish fellow, that faith without works is useless? Verse 24, you see that a man is justified by works and not by faith alone. And then verse 26, for just as the body without the spirit is dead, so also is faith without works. So also faith without works is dead. You know, I don't think I'd be stretching it too far if I was to take those same four verses in that chapter and substitute the word education for the word faith. And let's see if you don't agree with me. Let let me read them again now with the word education instead of faith. Verse 17, even so, education, if it has no works, is dead, being by itself. Verse 20, but are you willing to recognize, you foolish fellow, that education without works is useless? Verse 24, you see that a man is justified by works and not by education alone. And verse 26, for just as the body without the spirit is dead, so also education without works is dead. And you know, I also believe that I really wouldn't be stretching it too far if we were to take those same verses and substitute the word preaching for the words faith in those verses. Let's see if you don't agree with me. Verse 17, even so, preaching, if it has no works, is dead, being by itself. Verse 20, but are you willing to recognize, you foolish fellow, that preaching without works is useless? Verse 24, you see that a man is justified by works and not by preaching alone. Verse 26, for just as the body without the spirit is dead, so preaching without works is dead. I don't think I'm stretching it very far at all. 
I think the principle would certainly apply. And again, you see that the two are very similar because, again, both end up in and by themselves ending up in just inactivity and do-nothingness. Let me just throw this in for extra. Why is it, do you think, that there isn't much difference between the two? Between what we're hearing today on the boob tube and what we're hearing today from the pulpits of modern Christianity. Could it be because the same group of people who for the most part control our media sources are the very same people today who are influencing Judeo-Christianity. Could it possibly be that the results are the same from, for different reasons, but that the results are the same because the same people are, being, are behind the, the scenes pulling the strings? I don't think that's probably too far-fetched at all, do you? Let me ask you, so why doesn't modern Christianity, because I really don't care what the rest of the world is doing, I don't care what they say are, are the answers, I really don't care what's coming across in the boob tube. I find it interesting and it's sometimes enlightening. To... I'd like to start the message by asking you if you've noticed recently the new phenomena on TV. And when I say recently, I mean in the last three to five years, or at least that would be my estimation. The new phenomena that is taking place on television in the last three to five years. For the last, and again, it's my guess that that's, that's about how long it's been, but for the last three to five years, television, or at least I should say those who are controlling that form or this form of entertainment, and I probably should say not so much entertainment, but mind control, those who are who are controlling that form of mind control. For the last three or five years, television, or at least those who are controlling that form of media, have been telling us the modern day answer for all of America's woes. Have you noticed that? And I guess, again, last three or five years. Anybody want to venture a guess what, what they have been telling us is the answer for all of America's woes? No, the television. No, oh, television definitely isn't gonna, gonna. They're they're doing everything to destroy Christianity. Do your Anybody? Own thing. Do your own thing. No, that. Do your own thing. No. Anybody else want to venture a guess what the answer to all of America's woes are according to the television for the last three to five years? Some of those things are definitely being promoted. Anybody else have a guess? The answer that we have been hearing over and over and over again on television for, again, I would have guessed the last three to five years, the answer for all of America's woes is education. You know, we're constantly, it's at commercial time that it happens, but constantly, I saw it again yesterday, and I don't watch a lot of TV, but I've watched enough in the last three to five years, and I know that we're constantly being bar bombarded by this. And that is that we're you know, at commercial time, celebrities and movie stars and sports figures are coming onto the TV screen and saying, get all the facts when it comes to immorality, when it comes to the AIDS epidemic, and when it comes to homosexuality. Get all the facts. Get educated. That's the answer. For those problems, and obviously then for all of the rest of the problems that America must face today, or is facing today. You know, it kind of reminds one of, of the so-called Age of Enlightenment. That period of time in, in mankind's history, specifically in the 18th century over in France, most specifically, known as the quote-unquote great, into, uh, known for, rather, the great, quote-unquote, great intellectual awareness with its great emphasis on education and quote-unquote scientific research being the answer for all of mankind's woes. Kind of reminds you of that same period of time. You know, if... Uh, well, let me do this first. What was the result 
of that great period of time, as some people would want to call it, this great period of great intellectual awareness that took place in the, seven, in the 1700s. What was the result of that period of time? Well, one of the things that was a result of, of the, uh, this age of enlightenment is what, what, what would be called naturalism. What's the result of naturalism in this day and age? Naturalism uh, had its outcome found in evolutionary thinking. One of the other outcomes or results of, of the Age of Enlightenment is what we'd call deism and atheism, with its outcome being in this day and age, humanism. And another one of the outcomes of that great Age of Enlightenment was moral decay and degradation which resulted in one of the most corrupt periods of history in the history of mankind. Now, let me share something with you. If what we're hearing today on the boob tube as being the answer for America's woes is the same that they were giving as an answer to all of America or all of the world's woes back then, if the answer is the same, then you can bet that the outcome or the results are going to be the same too. Should we expect anything different today as a result of this promotion of education being the answer for all of these problems? Now, is that meant to be a slam? What I've just said, is that meant by me to be a slam or a put down on science, not true science that is, on science and education? By no means. I don't mean what I just said and how I said it to be a slam or a put down on true science and education. For in Proverbs 1, Solomon said, Proverbs 1 and verse 5, he said, a wise man will hear and increase in learning. In Proverbs 1 and verse 7, he said, fools despise wisdom and instruction. In Proverbs 2 and verse 2, he said, make your ear attentive to wisdom. Incline your heart to understanding. Proverbs 3 and verse 13, he says, how blessed is the man, the man who finds wisdom and the man who gains understanding. And then it goes on to explain that their worth is far more valuable than gold and silver and jewels and emeralds. In Proverbs 4, in verse 7, it, he says, The beginning of wisdom is acquire wisdom, and with all your acquiring, get understanding. I'm not putting down true science and true education, but I'm here to tell you this morning that learning, understanding, and education is next to worthless if it's not centered in the God and creator of this universe. There's a principle found in Psalms 127, verses 1 and 2. I'd like you to turn there with me. Psalms 127, and verses 1 and 2. It's a principle. I don't think it's meant to be just taken literally. I believe it's meant to be a principle. Listen carefully. It says, Psalms 127, starting with verse 1, it says, Unless Yahweh builds the house, they labor in vain who build it. Unless Yahweh guards the city, the watchman keeps awake in vain. In vain do they rise up early to retire late to eat the bread of painful labors, for he gives to his beloved even in his sleep. I don't think he's talking about just going out and building a house, that if we do it without, without Yahweh, or if Yahweh's not behind what we do when we go out and build a home on a lot, I don't think that's what he's talking about. He's talking about a principle that unless God is with us in, with us in and through everything that we do, it's in vain. And the same holds true for learning understanding, and education. If it's not centered and founded first in our God, it is worthless or at least next to worthless. Solomon, the wisest of the wise, declared in Ecclesiastes that the increase of knowledge and wisdom were in vain. Wisdom and knowledge, that is, in and by itself. Wisdom and knowledge without God. But didn't Solomon, I just read it to you, didn't Solomon advise us to cr increase in learning and to acquire understanding? Well, he certainly did. But he also made it very clear 
in Proverbs 1 and in Proverbs 9 that the, that the fear of Yahweh is the beginning of knowledge and the fear of Yahweh is the beginning of understanding. Yes, we're to acquire them, but we've got to understand that principle first, that he is where it begins. There is no answer in education without God in the education. Now, I'll guarantee you, the education that the boob tube is promoting today does not have God in it or even plan to be in it. Now, let me ask you, in light of all that, in light of what is being promoted across the TV waves in this day and age, in the last few years, in light of that, in light of what I've just shared with you, let me ask you, is modern Christianity's answer any better than what we're hearing today on the boot tube? I really want you to think about this next question. I want you to really contemplate this next question. I'm serious about this. I want you to think about this. What is modern Christianity's answer? What is modern Christianity's answer to homosexuality today? If somebody's got an answer to that, if somebody can come up with an answer to what modern Christianity's answer to homosexuality is today, I'd like to hear it. What is modern Christianity's answer to the AIDS epidemic today? What is modern Christianity's answer to immorality, to homosexuality, to lesbianism, to, to incest, and whatever else you want to name that could, be, that could be under the title or the heading of immorality. What is Christianity's answer, modern Christianity's answer, that is, to those things? Again, if you've got an answer, I'd love to hear it. What's, what's their answer? Or for that matter, for any major problem facing America or even the rest of the world today. What is their answer? Oh, I know. I know what it is. It's come to Yahshua or Jesus. That's I use as the Hebrew pronunciation. But it's, oh, come to Yahshua and he will change your life. Well, that's fine for those who will make that decision. But we already know that, that, that those people are going to be a very small minority of people. Matthew 7 and verse 14 makes that very clear when it says, For the gate is small and the way is broad that leads, or excuse me, the way is small and the way, the gate is small and the way is narrow that leads to life and few are those who find it. That answer is fine for those who are going to enter the narrow gate. But what about the rest? For Matthew 7 and verse 13 tells us, For the gate is wide and the way is broad that leads to destruction, and many are those who enter by it. You know about the only answer that modern Christianity today has for all of those problems, the problems facing America or the world today? You know what their only, about their only answer is? It's pray. Pray about the problem. I know I've shared with you before this cartoon, maybe two or three times, but I can't help but use it again in this particular message. It's the cartoon with the, with the father and the mother and the little boy in the living room one evening at their home. And the father is sitting working on, uh, we're obviously working on a crossword puzzle in, the, in the, news, the evening newspaper. The mother is next to him reading the Bible and the little boy is watching the TV with a, with a uh, rock star um, a, a female rock star with her, most of her bosom showing. And the father asks this question. He says, what's a six-letter word for something that can help stop the spread of AIDS? And the little boy, as he watches the rock star with her bosom showing, has the little dots going up. He doesn't say it, but the little dots that shows that he's thinking it. And he says, he's thinking, let's see, C-O-N-D-O-M, condom. And the mother at the same time says, uh, let's see, P-R-A-Y-E-R, -E prayer. Prayer! 
there's the answer. What I want to tell you, as I told you before, that the little boy, what he was thinking, was probably a whole lot better answer. It wasn't the right answer, but I guarantee you it was a whole lot better answer than the Christian mother who happened to be reading her Bible at the time. See what they're saying because they reveal where the world is at, but I really don't care. But what I do care about is modern Christianity or that which calls itself Christianity today. So let me ask the question, so why doesn't modern Christianity have any answers today outside of the fact that she is being controlled, manipulated, and influenced by the Jews? Why doesn't modern Christianity have any answers today? Well, could it be because she has discarded and thrown away the one effective tool that God designed to potently deal with the ungodly and the unrighteous in this world. Could that be the reason? Because she has abolished and done away with and nailed to the cross the laws of God and most specifically the judgments of God. You know, most of modern Christianity today, as you are all fully aware, most of modern Christianity today is declaring that the New Testament is stating that Yah's laws are not for these new covenant times. Most of Christianity is declaring that. Most of the pulpits, most of the preachers behind the pulpits, and thus most of their flocks are declaring that very thing, that God's laws are not for these new covenant times. Well, what in the world would you call what they're doing to God's laws when they do that? Turn with me to Ezekiel chapter 22. I believe Ezekiel chapter 22 describes the very thing that's happening today in this era of time when preachers and Christians are proclaiming that Yah's laws are not for today. Ezekiel 22 and verse 26, listen carefully. It says, Her priests have done violence to my law and have profaned my holy things. They have made no distinction between the holy and the profane and they have not taught the difference between the unclean and the clean. And they hide their eyes from my Sabbaths, and I am profaned among them. You know, what better way? This passage talks about that the priests, the preachers, the prophets, whatever you want to call them, are doing violence to his law. And let me ask you, what better way to do violence to his law than to abolish it? How are they doing it? Well, I believe that's described in Isaiah 5 and verses 24 and 25. Turn there, if you would. How are they doing violence to it? Isaiah chapter 5. And listen to verses 24 and 25. It says, or at least the last part of 24 and the first part of 25, it says, For they have rejected, that's New American Standard, King James I like, I like a lot better because it describes a lot better what's going on today. King James says, For they have cast away the law of Yahweh of hosts and despised the word of the Holy One of Israel. On this account, the anger of Yahweh has burned against his people. They've cast away, they've put away, They've abolished. However you want to say it, that's what's happening today from American pulpits. They have cast away the laws of God. And God's anger are upon them. What's been the result? Turn with me to Ezekiel chapter 7. What's been the result of their casting away the laws of God? I believe we have a prophecy right here again of what's happen what is happening right now or even has happened in America because of what is being preached across America's pulpits. In Ezekiel 7, in verse 26, listen carefully. It says, disaster will come upon disaster. And rumor, and right now, people, that's being fulfilled in this country. Disaster upon disaster in this country, at least for those who haven't been mesmerized to think that America is still the epitome of what all nations are supposed to be. 
For our eyes, if we get our minds off our pocketbooks and see what's going on in America, we realize that right now we're having disaster after disaster. It says, disaster will come upon disaster and rumor will be added to rumor. Then they will, listen to it, They said it says, then they will seek a vision from a po- prophet. And then it says, but the law will be lost from the priest and counsel from the elders. What is it saying? The law, they've lost the law and thus they've lost their counsel. In other words, they don't have any answers. They cast away the one thing that gives us the answers for all of America's woes, and thus they don't have counsel for the problems that are facing the people of the time. They've thrown away the answer book, the laws of God. What, what, what else is a, is a result of, of that taking place? Turn to to uh, Habakkuk chapter 1. Habakkuk chapter 1. Now, you're all there, I'm sure, already. Let's go to verse 4. I'm going to go ahead and read it. Habakkuk, I, I cheated. I put this in here so I didn't have to flip through and find it. So if, you don't, if you're not there by the time I, by the time I start reading, I, I'll, I'll let it pass this time. Habakkuk chapter 1 and verse 4. Listen to what it says. It says, Therefore the law is ignored and justice is never upheld. Why is justice never upheld? Because the law has been ignored. The answer, the, the, uh, uh, what's the, what's the, how do I want to say that? Um, the absolute. You know, some people today, they're saying there are no absolutes. Well, they, they're right. You know why there are no absolutes in America today? Because America's, America's preachers have thrown out the law. And when you throw out the law, there are no absolutes. And that's what it's saying here. It says, the law, therefore, the law is ignored and justice is never upheld. Man, all you have to do is go to our, go to our court system, or our, to our courts, probably any day of the week, and sit in on a, on a trial of any consequence. And you'll find that that is, being, that is happening today. Bob, do you think you could probably agree to that? And he's been at the end of it. Of course, I have too. That justice is not be, never upheld. Why again? Because the law has been ignored. Not only ignored, it's worse today than it was then. The preachers have thrown it away. And then it goes on. It says, for the wicked surround the righteous. Therefore, justice comes out perverted. Justice, there is no justice today or very little of it in today's courts because the preachers have thrown out the law. And what's the result of that? Habakkuk 1 and verses 5 through 9. Listen carefully. It says, Look among the nations. Observe. Be astonished. Wonder. Because I am doing something in your days. You would not believe it if you were told. And most today, it's happening today. And most people do not want to believe that it's happening. Listen to what he says. Verse 6. For behold, I am raising up the Chaldeans. Who are the Chaldeans? The Chaldeans were the Babylonians. Who was the daughter of the Babylonians? The Edomites. Who are the Edomites found in today, according to themselves? The Jews who practice Talmudic Judaism. This is happening, this very thing is happening today, and you can't hardly convince anybody of it. And they admit it themselves. For behold, verse 6, For behold, I am raising up the Chaldeans who march throughout the earth to seize dwelling places which are not theirs. They are dreaded and feared. Their justice and authority originate with themselves. Their horses are swifter than leopards and keener than wolves in the evening. Their horsemen come galloping. Their horsemen come from afar. They fly like an eagle swooping down to devour. All of them come for violence. Their horde of faces moves forward. They collect captives like sand. People, that's happening today in America and throughout most of the rest of the world. It is happening. What's the result of the the law of God being ignored? Not only do do people no longer have answers, not not, not only do we not find justice being carried out in the land any longer, but we found that God says when you reject His laws and thus reject His justice, His laws and judgments, 
he's going to substitute his justice with someone else's justice. There's a void. You throw out God's laws, his judgments, his justice, and then there's a great big void, and God doesn't leave the void empty. He says, I'm going to give you somebody else's justice. Isn't, and isn't that what it says when it says that he's going to raise up these Chaldeans, and in verse 7, whose justice and authority originate within themselves. That's what we have in our courts today, in our judicial system. We no longer have a judicial system that's been based upon God's laws and his judgments. We have a judicial system based on the justice of the Chaldeans, the Babylonians, the Edomites, and modern Judaism. You know, it's nothing but false doctrine when preachers today preach that the New Testament is stating that the laws of God have been done away. The New Testament teaches much the opposite. Yah's laws are for today. You know, there's what I call the avoided scriptures by most of the pulpits today in this, in this regards. The scriptures that they don't want to preach on the scriptures that they don't want to touch, the scriptures they, they, that they don't want to share with you because it doesn't fit the doctrine they're teaching when they teach that God's laws have been abolished. Let me share some of them with you. Like Matthew 5 and verses 17 through 19. And just, these are just a few of the many scriptures, the avoided scriptures on this subject. Matthew 5 and verses 17 through 19 where Yahshua himself says, Do not think that I came to abolish the law and the prophets. But to fulfill, or it could have been translated, fully preach. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter or stroke shall pass away from the law. In other words, that law is in existence until heaven and earth are destroyed. I don't know about you, but I still feel like I'm probably a part of that. That I'm still walking on this earth. It hasn't been destroyed, and thus God's law hasn't been destroyed. And then he goes on, whoever then annuls one of the least of these commandments and so teaches others shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever keeps and teaches them, he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Or how about Romans 2 and verse 13 where it says, for not the hearers of the law are just before God, but the doers of the law shall be justified. Man, that's in contradiction to every other scripture they use. And you're, I'll guarantee you, you've never heard a sermon based on that text. They, do, they ignore it. They avoid it. They wish it wasn't in their Bible because it gives them all kinds of problems with the doctrine that t with the other scriptures. They don't know how to rectify the other scriptures that say we're not justified by the law. And yet Paul said, the same man who said, said the other, said in Romans 2.13 that the, it's not the hearers, but the doers of the law who will be justified. When? Not under the old covenant, under the new covenant. And they've got no explanation for it. Or how about Romans 3 and verse 31, where it says, do we then nullify the law through faith? Now, if you were to ask that of the, of the majority of the preachers today, how would they answer? Do we nullify the law through faith? I bet you could do it today. I bet you could go to most of the pulpits and t today, go to the preachers and just ask that part of the verse. Don't tell them where it's from so they can't go and look. Ask them that question and say, do we nullify the law through faith? And I'll, be, I'll just about guarantee you they'd say yes. That the law has been nullified through faith because they avoid this scripture too. It's because it goes, Paul goes on to say, he says, may it never be on the contrary we establish the law. 1 Corinthians 7 and verse 19 says, Circumcision is nothing, and uncircumcision is nothing, but what matters is the keeping of the commandments of God. Hebrews 8 and verse 8 and 10 says, Behold, days are coming, says Yahweh, when I will effect a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. And then in verse 10 it picks it up and it says, For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, says Yahweh, I will put my laws into their minds and I will write them upon their hearts. 
He says, I'm going to take those commandments, statutes, and judgments that were on written on, on tablets of stone, those very same laws, I'm going to take them off of the, the, the tablets of stone and I'm going to put them on your hearts and your minds. And that's the difference between the new covenant and the old. And 1 John 5 and 3 is another one where it says, For this is love for God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. Those are just some of the what I call the avoided scriptures by those who teach that God's law has been done away, that the New Testament supposedly teaches that. Well, I avoid those scriptures because they certainly don't fit in with that doctrine that they teach. And there's 31 other scriptures that I could have shared with you at the same time. You know, very clearly, very clearly, the laws of God are for today. Now, I go into much more detail concerning that issue. I share in one message the 31 other New Testament scriptures that very clearly teach again that God's laws are for today. Um, I also deal with in much more detail the answer to what appears to be a dilemma between scriptures in the New Testament that appear to say that God's laws have been done away with and these other New Testament scriptures that very clearly say that God's law has not been abolished. I go into much more detail and I'm not going to have time to do it in this message or in the ones to come here. Um, So if you have not heard those messages or you want to want to listen to them again, I cover in much more detail, uh, cover this in much more detail in tapes number T006, Deliverance from Christian Anarchists, and tape number T065, Harmonizing the New Testament Scriptures on the Law of, on the law of God. And those are available for anyone here or on the tape ministry that will be receiving this tape if you would like uh, uh, more detailed messages that deal with how those passages are, are uh, harmonized. There is no question, and I want you to listen very carefully to this, that God's laws are still in force, at least in principle, according to the Scriptures. Listen carefully. They are still in force. But the problem is, is that they're not enforced. And that is in practice. And that's to be explained in much more detail in the message to come. They're in force, but they're not enforced. You know, education is the answer. But not the education that's being offered today by those in control of our government, in control of our public schools, and in control of the media. And it's not the kind of education that's being offered by those who are influencing modern Judeo-Christianity today either. Yahshua warned us in Matthew 16 and verse 6. He said, watch out and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And then it's explained what he meant by that in verse 12. When it says, then they understood that he did not say to beware of the leaven of bread, but of the teaching, or you could put in the education of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And you know who they are today. They've admitted it. People, I want you to know this morning, as we use this message as an introduction to a short series that's to follow, that education is the answer when it's God-centered education, when it's law-centered education, and when it's action-centered education. I want to read to you in closing these words that were preached by Moses at Mount Sinai when he was given the commandment, statutes, and judgments to write down. The words, these words that were this admonition that he was given and that he gave to those people there and for us in this day as well. Listen carefully in regards to the kind of education that is the answer. Verse 1, he says, Now this is the commandment, the statutes, and the judgments which Yahweh your God has commanded me to teach you, that you might do them in the land where you are going over to possess it, 
so that you and your son and your grandson might fear Yahweh, your God, to keep all his statutes and his commandments, which I commanded you all the days of your life, and that your days may be prolonged. O Israel, you should listen and be careful to do it, that it may be well with you, and that you may multiply greatly, just as Yahweh, the God of your fathers, has promised you in a land flowing with milk and honey. Let's stand and we'll close in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, Lord, I'm thankful personally, Father, that you've opened my eyes to understand and see that, Father, your laws have not been put away and that they have not been abolished. And I ask personally that you forgive me, Father, for ever preaching that in the past, for having preached as so often as being preached today, that that your laws have been nailed to the cross, for misunderstanding that passage and what it really says. Father, forgive me, Father, for it's the preachers today who are doing the greatest, greatest harm, Father, to, to America and her people today and their freedom. Lord, I pray that you'd use this message in the series to follow, to open up our hearts. Father, that you'd protect it, Father, and the things that are going to be said, that you'd use it, Lord, to wake up our people, to bring them back, Father, in obedience unto you, in doing, Father, what is necessary to deal with the problems that we face today in America. We ask these things, and in them, Father, that you'd be glorified. We praise you and petition you, Father, in and through Yahshua the Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen.